Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here. This week is a dense one. Lots of fun testing at Starbase to catch up on. Polaris Dawn, due to fly in March of next year, already has some nice initial information that might surprise you. Relativity Space sharing their next generation of 3D printing technology and some previously unseen test fire footage. The final countdown is on for Falcon Heavy. It has been well over three years since the last one, so this is going to be epic. We have a Starlink launch and some updates about the network, Progress MS-21 delivering more essential supplies to the International Space Station, and a bunch more. The week started off straight into full stack testing of Booster 7 and Ship 24 as they close in on the much anticipated 33 engine static fire. Work was promptly underway on Monday morning to prepare for a big day of testing. We were hoping for a full cryo test of the full stack, a first for these two vehicles. The orbital launch pad work platform was moved away and once the pad was clear, the tank farm spooled up, but there was a hiccup of some sort it seemed. Hours later, cars were back at the pad with the team checking the systems over before leaving again for another attempt. Yes, the testing looked to be resuming again with the tank farm venting picking back up. By 4pm, finally liquid nitrogen began flowing into Booster 7's liquid oxygen tank. As the frost line increased, the vents on the tower began venting more, indicating that propellant load on the ship would soon begin. And there we had it, frost appearing there on Ship 24 as well. After about an hour of cryo testing both vehicles, SpaceX started to detank. For whatever reason, it seemed to take forever to fully unload the Starship itself. There seemed to be a slight problem draining all of the nitrogen, but it was cleared eventually and the pad was opened for the workers early the next day. All in all, it seemed like a successful test. The testing recommenced on Wednesday. This time, we could see the tank farm was active, but couldn't see much more for a few hours. All of a sudden, without the usual venting from the orbital launch mount, we started to see a nice frost ring on the booster's methane tank. I'm wondering if they were testing out a slightly new procedure here. After a while, the booster was being detanked again, and it seemed like that was it for the day, but soon we could see a frost line appear again on the booster's methane tank, shortly followed by Ship 24's methane tank. This time, neither the orbital launch mount or the launch tower did its usual purge venting beforehand. Now, I will say this, seeing all that cryogenic propellant mass in the top methane tanks with seemingly nothing in the oxygen tanks below made me slightly nervous. Remember what happened with SN3 when the bottom tank was not pressurized correctly? Yeah, we don't want to see that again. Anyway, all went as planned and both vehicles were detanked and depressurized. As the trial process continues with both Booster 7 and Ship 24, we should hopefully start to see Ship 25 going through its cryogenic testing process in parallel. The question that I've had in my mind recently though is would the current Ship 24 Booster 7 full stack simply end up as another Pathfinder vehicle that would never actually leave the ground? Perhaps Ship 25 could be the first to be used for an orbital test flight. After all, this full stack has been down here being tested so frequently with repeated moves of the booster back and forth from the production site. Who better to ask than Elon Musk on Twitter? Are SpaceX planning on using Booster 7 and Ship 24 for the first launch? Well, there you go. He came back there stating that this is indeed still the plan, unless Booster 7 or Ship 24 is damaged in testing. The more important thing to consider is the volume of production. We now have the Star Factory here allowing cleaner, faster, and potentially more automated work to occur. The production line for ships and boosters ramping up quickly. Likewise, I would assume the same regarding the volume of Raptor engines required for the task. Musk also added that each new ship and booster has incremental design improvements. It's just amazing seeing all of these vehicles lining up just as captured beautifully by Nick and NASA Spaceflight here. Just imagine getting into position to take this shot. All four vehicles in view at the same time. Ship 24 stacked up there on Booster 7, with Booster 8 between that and Ship 25 in front. You are the absolute master at getting those angles, Nick. We can indeed see that the production line is ramping up. I just think that every step of this process towards the first orbital test flight is absolutely mesmerizing. History is literally unfolding right before our eyes. I think it's important sometimes to just pause and then look back to see just how far and how quickly this has all evolved. Now, here we are, hopefully just weeks away now from the first full stack orbital test flight. That is going to be an event that you will never forget. 
What is the next step though? I suspect it is going to be a static fire, maybe with the full stack and maybe not, but it sure will be fun finding out. To further ensure the success of future testing coming up, SpaceX has been beefing up the orbital launch mount with a lot of extra plating added to protect the ground service equipment pipes going up the legs. That was beautifully captured here by Starship Gazer. Over at the build site and just hours after publishing last week's video, Booster 10's methane tank finished stacking with the addition of the last quad barrel. SpaceX really has not wasted any time with Booster 9 as its liquid oxygen tank was brought right into view into the mega bay and after some alignment it was placed on the transport stand previously used for Booster 7. Before long here it was, Booster 9 now the latest fully stacked booster and all of this is shown here on Brendan's diagram as well. Before we know it, we are going to have four boosters lined up. A fun thing to note is that it took SpaceX 12 days less compared to Booster 8. Another improvement is that Booster 9 already received a lot of extremely visible work such as the black COPVs here. Neither Booster 8 nor Booster 7 had those during stacking. Yet another example of that production speed increase. The next ship in line to be completed, Ship 26, had its nose cone and forward dome assembly lifted off the turntable in the high bay on Tuesday after being successfully welded together last week. Late this week, it moved over to the mid bay next to its partial tank section. This move was most likely to make space for Ship 27 because its middle liquid oxygen section was moved into the high bay. Not long after that, the common dome section was moved in as well, and at the same time, yeah, ouch. Thankfully both of those drivers seemed to be okay. Now if you remember in last week's episode, I talked about the domes no longer needing to be sleeved or flipped outside in the dome yard, instead this would be done inside the star factory. Well this week SpaceX moved the always used sleeving stand over to the scrap yard, so that fully confirms that we will sadly no longer see any sleeves or flips being done outside anymore. Okay, so over at Florida, plenty of activity. Last week we saw three horizontal tanks leaving Launch Complex 39A, but at the time we weren't sure why. That question was soon answered as teams loaded these three tanks up onto the barge inside the turn basin this week and the next day this barge departed. Perhaps SpaceX will be taking a delivery of other tanks soon. At Launch Complex 39A, the inner dome for the mystery tank was finally lifted recently, bringing this tank one step closer to completion. We also had the amazing Greg Scott and Fariel taking to the skies over the site at the Cape late this week. Kicking off at Starbase Florida, there is a lot of new insights to see. Let's start off with the Star Factory. First of all, the siding has had a load of doorways cut out, some sized for regular humans, typical looking small vehicle doors, and obviously the existing massive doorway there suitable for Starship segments. That I think adds a neat new sense of scale. The roofing of the Star Factory is screaming along, the second section fully wrapped up, and the third section now well underway. And actually, check this out, you can see these three metal parts above the doorway here, and this matches the render that Musk shared back in June with the last section of the Star Factory being quite a lot taller. The ship quick disconnect arm is receiving more pipework, and right next to it there is more being assembled. This QD arm is going to roll out almost completely finished, so awesome to see. The chopsticks are still progressing nicely as well, with these mystery white structures having been added recently. I've got no idea what these are for, so let me know in the comments if you've got any thoughts. Over here we have the Mechazilla Tower number 3 segments, location for this still to be determined, and we can see that the first two have the main structures finished with flooring being installed. The third section has all four corner pillars placed and the main structure almost done. And then over here all four columns for the fourth section are on site now with the majority of the main frame items. Now I'm talking about the upcoming Falcon Heavy mission shortly, but this here is actually the core booster of a different Falcon Heavy. That is because it doesn't have any landing legs, grid fins or any other recovery hardware. Yes, this is the center core planned to fly attached to its side boosters later this year. 
Now, before moving on to the next segment, you may have noticed this new piece on the set behind me here. This just showed up out of the blue, and it is Stardesk. This 3D printed kit has closely followed the Starship development story, especially through all of the anticipation involved around the cryogenic fueling and venting that we are witnessing right now. So Caleb here designed this, a mini version of Starbase for a desk. The really mind-blowing part is that it actually does venting of its own powered by a simple USB connection. There is this little humidifier disk inside that drives that vapor. So cool. And this is a kit that can be 3D printed if you have the equipment, or it can be printed for you. Big thanks to Caleb for creating this, and just as a bit of a background, he actually won a NASA design challenge a few years back for the Rassor Regolith Trap. Very awesome, and thanks for sending this over, Caleb. It will have a nice home right here on the set. The link to that is in the description if you want to check that out. It is always so great to support the amazing artists out there, you wouldn't believe how much that helps. Okay, so the Polaris Dawn mission is getting closer and closer, and it's worth noting today that they have recently published a huge set of science and research experiments for the missions ahead. I won't run through these all here in detail as there's loads to cover, but in particular, this one from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory interests me. Yes, this is all to do with Galactic Cosmic Rays, or GCR. There is just so much that we don't know in that regard, and the idea here, as stated, is to measure the high energy neutron environment in the Dragon spacecraft using materials to record neutron interactions. Now, I'm making an entire video filled with information like this, which I think you're going to love. What is most surprising to me is that we have almost no useful data on this. You may think that we recorded a load of this GCR data with the Apollo program missions, but actually, the detectors didn't adequately record those super high forms of radiation, such as that from galactic cosmic rays. This is absolutely critical to fully understand for deep space missions, of course, especially long duration missions to Mars and beyond. So yes, make sure you subscribe to check that video out. That's going to drop midweek, hopefully sometime in November. So as Relativity Space near their first launch attempt of Terran 1, here is a little glimpse of the raw power that we can look forward to. Thanks to Cosmic Perspective here for the amazing footage of the recent test of the core stage with its nine Aeon 1 engines. Just listen to that roar. This is just a small glance at it, but make sure you check out the typical 4K quality version from the link in the description. Absolutely amazing. So besides the first launch looking likely to happen in the coming months, what else has Relativity Space been up to? Well, the much larger Terran R launch vehicle's development continues to march forward also. An announcement shared here this week left me pretty gobsmacked, the unveiling of the Stargate fourth generation 3D metal printer. Incredibly, this new version of Stargate moves horizontally using multiple wires to feed the printhead that will be used for construction of not just launch vehicles, but also other projects. Projects. Now, I've said this before, but such innovative technology is super useful in other industries as well. In fact, Relativity is working with an undisclosed client in the nuclear fusion industry to potentially use this new piece of 3D printing tech to produce parts for a fusion reactor. In my video here on future propulsion technology, we talked quite a bit about the potential of fusion for energy generation as well. Not only would such technology provide an ultimate clean source of power on Earth if we can ever managed to crack it, but reactors to power habitats on the Moon and Mars is a small slice of our sci-fi dreams. So this new Stargate Gen 4 printer is predicted to be up to 12 times faster than the previous printers, and it's also designed to be capable of producing four Terran R launch vehicles every year just to begin with. We had another Starlink launch from Vandenberg Space Force Base on Thursday afternoon. Booster 1063 launched here for the eighth time, hurling the next batch out of the atmosphere. Now, there have been a few little announcements on Starlink this week. Firstly, Starlink is now available in Jamaica, as shown here on the updated Starlink map. And SpaceX were also reminding users that they can now enjoy the high-speed, low-latency internet while on the move. The high-performance Starlink service that provides that in motion is ready 
continue to go with orders being accepted. Anyway, another textbook Starlink flight. The landing for this one was on the drone ship, of course I still love you. Just check that out. I had a few people commenting last week saying that I shouldn't be showing these anymore, but I mean, come on, it's still pretty amazing, isn't it? Just imagine witnessing one of these landings close by all the way out in the ocean. It would be freaking incredible. So yeah, that was a wrap for the mission with deployment confirmed after the stream. We also have some pretty awesome news coming up this next week, Falcon Heavy. Yep, this is going to be mind-blowing. Here is the beast as it was preparing for launch in the hangar at Space Launch Complex 39A. This mission is coming right up for the USS F-44 flight sending a secret pair of satellites into orbit, a mission that is actually now over two years past its originally planned launch date due to that customer delay. If all goes to plan, we should be watching the 27 engines roar to life, lifting the monster into the sky on Tuesday the 1st of November in just a few days. The first launch since June of 2019 for this vehicle. Yep, it has been that long. Three years and four months. Now, in this mission, SpaceX are intentionally expending the center core. That is the first that will be intentionally discarded in a long, long time. Then we are going to have the twin side boosters completing that breathtaking simultaneous touchdown back at the landing zones at Cape Canaveral. Now, what you might notice is that the second stage has a gray band, a very nice render of this by Tony Bella. Now, we've only seen this gray band a few times on Falcon 9s, never on a Falcon Heavy. And for this mission, it is required due to the second stage needing a long coast phase between additional burns. It is grey to allow it to absorb more heat from the sun, otherwise the RP-1 can actually start to freeze solid. Yeah, that would be bad. So best of luck to SpaceX on this one. It is of course only the fourth flight ever for Falcon Heavy and its first classified flight. We also had another 2.5 ton delivery of supplies to the ISS late this week. A nice big chunk of that is fuel, which is going to be used to maintain the orbit of the space station, 420 kilograms of water alone, and then heaps of general clothing, food, and supplies for Expedition 68's crew. Obviously, the launch vehicle here was the Soyuz rocket seen here preparing to launch from Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. This was a night launch on top of the Progress spacecraft for MS-21. At two minutes into the flight, there was the classic Korolov cross, and like clockwork, the entire flight was super smooth. After the deployment of progress there, the mission then proceeded with a two-day catch-up followed by docking to the International Space Station. Now, before all of this, of course, Progress MS-19 needed to be undocked and deorbited to free up the Poisk module's Zenith docking port. This was done earlier in the week, which left the port available for MS-21 to autonomously dock. So yes, it is nice for the crew up there to have some fresh supplies, and speaking of the International Space Station, a massive thank you today to Henson Shaving supporting this video. This amazing bunch of engineers went from building aerospace equipment for the International Space Station along with other space projects to adapting their engineering method to create this Henson razor. Now, I'd never tried a single blade razor before. It always seemed too easy to get the wrong angle and nick yourself with it, so I just stuck with a typical plastic cartridge razor. Well, Henson sent me one to try, and I tell you, there was no going back. To manufacture this, they use CNC machines at aerospace standards standards, built so precisely actually that the blade itself is held extremely close to the edge of the razor, with it only extending past the shave plane less than the thickness of a human hair. It almost seems impossible to cut yourself with it. At the same time, the blade is set at the recommended 30 degree angle for the perfect shave. As soon as the blade is getting a little dull, you can just switch it out by unscrewing the handle, pop the new blade in, and recycle the old. At only around 10 cents each, the cost of ownership is tiny. Even better, Henson Shaving will provide 100 of those blades to you for free if you use my code. Just head to hensonshaving.com, add the razor in the color you like along with the pack of 100 blades into your cart, enter the code Marcus in the last checkout screen, and there you go, 100 free blades. Upgrade your shaving experience to aerospace grade. The link is in the description. So on Sunday, almost a week ago, we had the GSLV Mark III launch by the ISRO. 
Now, this was an interesting launch in particular as it was sending 36 OneWeb satellites to low Earth orbit, a beautiful sight here at liftoff lighting up the midnight sky. Now, this story is a little out of the ordinary because all previous OneWeb satellites were launched by Soyuz. Due to all of the recent tension with Russia, flying on Soyuz was no longer an option as reported on back in March. Now, of course, OneWeb is instead going to fly three Falcon 9 launches and then one more ISRO launch to finish off the Constellation. Around two minutes after launch, the S-200 side boosters were separated, which was followed by the separation of the main booster a few minutes later. Now, it was all up to the final stage to deploy the satellites. So the GSLV is India's heaviest launch vehicle, capable of putting 10 tonnes into orbit. This launch was the variant's fifth and also the first private commercial launch. Soon after, it was confirmed that all 36 satellites were successfully delivered, and with that, the total OneWeb satellites in orbit rose to 464. OneWeb aimed to complete the entire 648 satellite constellation next year. So that about does it for the week. Remember that there is also the Long March 5B sending the third and final Tiangong space station module into orbit coming this week. That is hopefully launching on October the 31st as well. A busy week is coming. Also, just a little housekeeping thing. Please, please watch out for scam and spam replies in the comment thread below each week. Not just for my channel here, but also for any channel that you watch. There is just so much garbage appearing almost daily now. I do my best to have it all removed and I know that you are all smart enough to not fall for such things but I do worry that it's going to catch someone out. Always make sure that the account that you're communicating with is the proper one connected to the actual channel and in my case here it shows the verified tick as well. Thanks a heap to all of the patrons and the YouTube members here contributing to the channel. Hugely appreciated. The link is right there and it also allows you to join our closed Discord groups and get ad-free versions of these videos as well. Along with that I've also got some new merch designs designs coming real soon. You can browse around the store and check out the designs right there, including the one I'm wearing today. In the tile in the bottom left, this one is all about the challenges of long duration spaceflight and how Starship can help solve these problems. Then the other deep dive videos on the right there too. Thank you everyone for watching, liking and just engaging with what we do. You are awesome. I'll see you in the next video.